It's time for the playlist party with your host, Stephen Perkins. All right. Happy Tuesday to you. How you doing? I'm Stephen Perkins, and uh, we're almost at the end of 2020, inching away, and it feels good because I don't have to say 2020 anymore. I'm excited to say 2021 and just start fresh. So uh, I'm so honored to be part of the DW team and talk about music and drummers and drumming and music and back and forth. And this is my second playlist show. The first one, I kind of visited songs that turned me on when I was very young, 10, 12, 13, 14. And this session is more about funky drummers and how to set into a pocket and lay down a good funky pulse. So these are the tunes I picked for that feel. And for me, playing the drums is a personal experience and it's also enjoying other people in the space. And I was just talking about this with the DW team, how I miss being in a room with people. And if you would listen to these tracks we're going to go through, you can tell they worked together when they made the music and jamming it out and feeling off each other and responding. And also with funk music, it's about that great steady pulse. And you got people moving their butts. You don't want to stop that, but you also want to converse with the other musicians. And like great jazz drummers, they're listening to each other. And like great Motown drummers, they're keeping the pulse going. So I always learned that from Ringo and Charlie Watts and Mitch Mitchell. They understood the Motown pocket, but also the influence of jazz and taking pointers from the bass line, the vocal cues, the guitar riff, and moving around. You know, if you listen to Honky Tonk Woman by the Stones, it starts at one BPM, beat per minute. By the end of the song, it's about three or four beats faster because they're a rock band and they get excited and they speed up. And I love that natural feel that you get from being in a room together and recording. But, uh, you know, drumming is about a personal reflection of who you are and how you feel that day. I'm 53 today and uh, I've turned 53 in September and I play a lot differently than I used to. But I'm also, in the same sense, the same drummer and the same hands, same feet, and trying to listen, but just getting better at it. So listening to these tunes kind of reminds me of what it was like learning how to play funk. You know, growing up, it was jazz and rock and roll. And it took me a while to really appreciate funky drummers and how important that funky pulse is. <clears throat> so first, we're going to go with James Brown. Now, you can do any James Brown song, and it's a real drum lesson. You, it teaches you so much about pocket and feel and response and how to be a tight, you know, like a band that fits like a puzzle. It's an amazing band. And no matter how many different tracks you listen to, if you get the box set, there's 200 songs. Any of those tracks will teach you something. Uh, today, we're going to go visit Superbad and uh, John Sparks, j -Bo, he lays down something which to me was so remarkable as a youngster, how the snare is on the one. And my instinct is to put the bass drum on the one. So that, first of all, was always a challenge to play to this song consistently for minute after minute and not go with my urge to lay down the kick drum. And you lay down that snare at the top. And every time the song starts, I feel like, oh, yeah, the snare drum. It starts off the tune and it stays there. And this version goes about eight or nine minutes. And I play to it in my drum room. And it's always a challenge to do that the whole time. Lay down that snare on the one. And uh, if you think about James Brown's band, if you gave them all a percussion instrument, it took away the bass and the saxophone and the guitar and put everybody on a, on a cowbell and a shaker and a djembe. It's really an African ensemble. And I hear a lot of Africa come out of these beats and the band. And it's like a drum circle to me, but they're just playing different instruments, not just drums. So uh, let's get into to James Brown's Super Bad with John Sparks on drums, and let's have a good time and check it out. There it is. Watch me, watch me. I got a 
got it. Watch me. Now putting that snare on the one. Hey! I got something that makes me want to shout. Opening that hi hat just so gently. What it's all about. I got soul and I'm super bad. If you put that drum beat on a djembe, you're in an African drum circle. And I'm super bad. That guitar riff. That could be a shaker. I got a move that tells me what to do. Sometimes I do. And his vocal approach. Sounds like a percussion instrument. The way he stabs. I want to try myself a few. There's that guitar. And I'm super bad. Imagine if that was an egg. Steady. It's like you're driving down a highway. And I don't need no one else. Sometimes I feel so nice. It's cool because it's one volume the whole time. It's quite dynamic, but it doesn't peak in valley with volume. And I'm super bad. What a challenge. To play that on the drums. Here it comes. Working the ride symbol. Up and down. All Putting the ride symbol perfectly in a spot where there's nothing else going on. Let it all hang out. Everyone's switching their spots. They're all important. But everybody takes a turn. Just like a drum circle. What it's all about. And you wonder what it was like in that room because they're so serious, but they're having fun. There's always a sense of humor underneath it all. Maceo blowing on the sax. And the saxophone to me was always the most expressive horn. Than the actual words. I got soul. I'm super bad. Then I was 15. I wasn't even sure what that all meant. Got the move. Still trying to figure it out. Sometimes I feel so nice. I said I want to try myself a few. I got soul. There's that snare drum just laying it on the one. Super bad. Pop. Back to the bridge. Up and down. And all around. Right on, people. And everything is so straight, but then he goes to the right symbol and it's just all swinging. If they don't, brothers and sisters, then you won't know. And you gotta wonder how many tunes they wrote. Give me. And kind of thought about how to come up with a brand new drum beat every time. It's like each James Brown song has a brand new, I guess in a way, all that scream. Every drum beat in James Brown's world is just like, never heard it before. And you never hear it again. They don't repeat it. And you know how tight the band is. You heard the legend of him finding and charging the band if they miss a part. They had to pay the guy. So they didn't miss anything, basically. And, you know, with Maceo blowing sax, James Addiction had a song called Maceo. It was about Perry's cat. And uh, we had the great Maceo Parker come and blow sax on our song. And he came to the studio and he said... Hey, why is the song called Maceo? You guys never met me. And Perry said, no, it's about my cat. And he goes, I'm a cat. I'm not your cat. It took a minute to explain that it was actually a feline, Perry's cat named Maceo. But uh, we were so honored to have him in the studio. And there's a track with me on drums and Maceo on sax. So if you get a chance, check out Maceo by Jane's Addiction.
I actually work the snare only on that. It's kind of like a, in a sense, a New Orleans second line snare part. And uh, Maceo definitely checked it out. And he said, who's on drums? It was me. But it's cool because the band never stops chugging away. But everybody gets a chance, really, to play their part. The guitar part changes up. Back to the bridge. And you know how James does it. He just calls out the bridge or the verse. Or, you know, they just all have to be listening because there really is no arrangement. It's just his voice leading the way. So that's the James Brown experience of Super Bad. Like I said, the challenge was always putting that snare on the one, being steady like a train, never really getting too loud or too soft, just the same tempo the whole time in the same volume, and responding to James's cues, you know, hit it to the bridge. And I always thought, if I can be in a band that lays down a snare for the one, and I've tried it a few times, there's a couple beats where I do it, and just stick to it for minute after minute, you know, and really give people something to dig into because it's all about the one in the, in the funk. And you've heard that from parliament, from George Clinton, from James Sly Stone, and uh, even some more of what we'll be listening to next. So if you get a chance, put on any James Brown song, get behind your drum set and experience what it's like to be a funky drummer. All right. So let's see what's next. Oh, the meters. Okay, so Zigaboo. He took the drum set to another level as far as I'm concerned. I never heard such steady pocket, such colorful drum parts, such a, a hat off to the Cajun and African feel of New Orleans. Never really showing off, but always so interesting and so... I guess in a sense, you know, uh, sensitive. He's a sensitive drummer and he doesn't work the toms that much or even the cymbals. It's really kick, snare, and hat. And he just lays it down. And even when there's a drum break, he stays on the drum, kick, snare, and hat. And he comes up with something that is somewhat in a variation of what the song is, but still something brand new. And just like James Brown, you can put on any meter song and you've got yourself a drum lesson. <clears throat> so this one is Sissy Strut, and I've played it a few times. <clears throat> Excuse me. So let's check it out. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Let's just start with the sound of that snare drum. Nowadays, people would try to get that, that kink out. You got to leave it in. Here we go. Ziggy is the man using that hi-hat. Now, John Bonham took a lot out of Ziggy. I know that. Listen to that. That's some Bonham shit right there. So much confidence. Hi, Alan. So steady. I had a chance to play with Leo, the guitar player, and uh, he taught me a lot. I did a session with him, and I tried my best to do the old zig. Here we go. So playful. So African. Never hitting a crash cymbal or a tom tom. And you know, the people are just having a good time dancing. And I think that's what's so cool about the meters. And it's a great name, the meters, because they just, it is, it's the meter that we're listening to. Now, when I had a hung out, a little hangout with Leo, the guitar player, he was telling me how important it was. For them to just play all night and let people dance. Never interrupt. 
that's why a lot of the music is instrumental. They just wanted people to dance. It wasn't about the lyrics. These drum breaks teach me so much about what to do and what not to do when I play the drums. And the song is pretty short, which makes you just want to put it back on over and over. I love that. Just go right back to the top. See if you can perfect it. And what a drum mix. The hat and the kick and the snare are all the same volume. Let's do it again. Now you got to wonder when they played this, how many different takes they did. But I have a feeling it was just a long jam. Kind of like what James Brown would do. It fades away. So what Zigaboo would do was that he would explore these cool second line drum parts coming out of New Orleans. Uh, but I never heard any drummer like that before him. And so it's just so original. And it's tough to be an original drummer because we all want to replicate our heroes. But you got to wonder, I would love to have a conversation with him, and who he was listening to and what turned him on. You know, I listened to a lot of Baba Tundi Alatunji, which is a uh, drummer from Africa, uh, Fele Kuti. And a lot of those drum parts are similar to what you hear Zigaboo do. It's just a real steady, percussive, in a sense, humps, you know, peaks and valleys. And it reminds me of someone kind of boxing, getting out of a way of getting punched and throwing punches. And it's not linear in any way. It's not straight. It's got these bumps like you're in a sand dune and you're kind of driving up and down. And like a, it's a roller coaster. It really is. He's a roller coaster drummer. And, you know, everybody in hip hop and in funk and in punk and metal and jazz, everyone's got a certain sound. But no one, I think, has ever sounded quite like Zigaboo. And, uh, you know, Sly Stone. And, and like I say, George Clinton and James Brown and, you know, some of the great funk bands that have been around, the Ohio Players. There's so many great bands, but nothing sounds like the Beaters. And you can tell they're from New Orleans. You can tell they're confident. And you can tell they partied all night. And they started over. They had a little crawfish in the morning and then went back to it. And uh, I had a great hang with Leo, like I said, the guitar player. And I, I said, what should, you know, tell me a little bit about how it all started. And he said, you know, I can't quote him exactly, but he had a, a great life, a guitar, a great haircut, and a car. And he was sent off to Vietnam, and he lost it all. They shaved his head. They took his guitar. They took his car. But when he came back, he started the meters. And he said he just wanted to party. And he just wanted to have a good time. And the very first jazz festival in New Orleans the meters played. And he said, I think it was, you know, a list of jazz bands was incredible. They were the only not traditional jazz band, but they played, I think, all three days. And everyone had a great time, not only listening to jazz, but dancing to the meters. So that's cool. Love you, Zigaboo. Okay, so let's check out what's next. Okay, Elvis Costello. Now, this. This took me to a whole nother level because Elvis, you know, came out of the punk rock scene in, in England, but it wasn't punk rock. It had the punk rock attitude, but he had such a great sounding band. Pete Thomas on drums is like this ska, funk, reggae influenced drummer with such a tight sound. And Elvis is such a great songwriter, a sensitive songwriter with amazing lyrics the coolest look, you know, nearly like a, a Buddy Holly, punk rock Buddy Holly look. And, you know, he had a band that was just so responsive to his sensitive lyrics. And uh, this song, Chelsea, I Don't Want to Go to Chelsea, always reminded me of Mitch Mitchell and uh, Fire by Hendrix. It was the, the drum beat was electric. It was busy but it never got in the way of the musicians. And I know Mitch Mitchell and Pete Thomas coming from England played a lot of dance halls. And there's uh, some of the beats that came out of there. They had 
names like the Silver Beat, which the Beatles called themselves, you know, the Silver Beatles at first. But there was different names for different beats. And I think this is one of the beats that came out of that genre. But he's so responsive. And just like what Zigaboo did with the snare drum, it's such a great tuned sounding drum set. The drum set just sounds amazing. And he's urgent. And he's always leaning forward, never laying back. And that's the punk rock attitude. You know, you got to get it done. And you got to get it done in three or four minutes. And... A lot of the punk rockers were known for not being great players. I disagree. And there's so much discipline in punk rock. And, you know, maybe Elvis doesn't go into the punk rock category as much as the Pistols or the Ramones or, for me, the greatest punk band, the Bad Brains. But it is. It's a punk rock band. So this is Chelsea, Pete Thomas, who I also got to meet once or twice. Let's check this out. Great to start a song with a drum beat, you know that. This one really pulses, it's like breathing. The vocal approach is so stabby. So funky. The drumming is similar to Zigaboo. Listen to that. It's up and down. Working the hi-hat. Responding off the band. Holding back here. And then turn it on the gas. Cool keyboard sound, right? The way he sings, it really puts you in a position to think that you're part of their world. You're in on the secret. I have no idea what he's talking about either. And Pete Thomas is like a scholar of rock and roll punk rock drummer in a band with great players. And they take it down, but they never get less urgent. It's always leaning forward. The vocal delivery is so punk rock. It's amazing because the band plays so many parts and notes, but they never get in the way of the song. You know, you always hear you got to play for the song. This band perfectly plays for the song. It's a, a great union of, of attitude and chops. And also another song that goes by too quickly. Disappears into the ether. And, you know, I play to that song over and over and I still don't get all the drum fills right. They start in weird places and they kind of lean left and right. And uh, Jane's Addiction did a show with Elvis Costello at summer camp about 10 years ago. And Elvis and Pete looked at my drum set and they were like, uh, so what do you have? Like six, four piece drum sets glued together. And, uh, you know, I love a big drum set cause I love all the different colors of the, of the spectrum, you know, to have eight inch drums and 20 inch floor toms. But you listen to Zigaboo and Pete Thomas and, and James Brown, and you realize it can all be done with a kick and a snare and a hat. You can, you can hold it down, and you don't need all the colors. If you've got a great band and great songs, you know everyone's kind of covering that spot. But uh, it's amazing how the, in a sense, you know, the 
the band that Elvis had, I think, I don't know if this is right or not, but I think he's had the same band his whole career. And that's just an amazing union and friendship. And just like me and Dave Navarro, we met when we were 14. We still play songs that we grew up on and it feels good. And it feels, you know, like an old friend, a good hug. And I think that's what you hear in this band with Elvis. But uh, I'm not sure if you noticed that, especially in the intro of that song, uh, the fire kind of, I guess, in a sense, the, the Mitch Mitchell, Jimi Hendrix fire comparison. Mm, cat, 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 kind of on the upbeat, that ska, dancey, skippy, drum beat. And it's so danceable. And, you know, you really got to dance like a punk to dance to it. But uh, it's um, it's one of my favorites. And just like the early funk that I started to dig into as a youngster, I always try to find funky drummers that stood out like that. And uh, they still, and those tunes still impress me and make an impression on my drumming. You know, just as much as Bonham or Phil Collins or, you know, the, the Ian Pace of Deep Purple. They've all got their own sound, and you can go back to their songs back from the old days, Bill Ward from Sabbath, and it's so original, and it really made the band what they were. You know, they, they say a great band can't be great without a great drummer. I, I believe that. You know, I love Sting. He's got great songs, but without Stuart Copeland, you know, enough said. Okay, so let's move on. Okay, this next tune, it's Brian Eno, for me, is such a spectacular musician. It came out of Roxy Music and started doing his own records and producing uh, Bowie and U2. And uh, this record came out in 74. The whole record is like a, it's just a piece of art. It really is. It's like the, the Sgt. Peppers of Abstract. And uh, the drummer, Freddie Smith, on this tune, this tune's called um, Third Uncle. I'm not sure what that means either. But this tune taught me so much about tight, aggressive drumming. And for me, I just pictured like a 12-inch hi-hat and a 20-inch kick and a tiny piccolo snare and just laying it down with just relentless power and urgency. And then it brought me to the point where I heard and I listened there's drum overdubs. He's playing roto toms or little tom toms. And that from that point on, I thought overdubbing on drum set is perfect. I love it. And you always wonder, well, who did it? You heard Stuart Copeland did it. Uh, and I thought, you know what? It's not cheating. It's making the record better. It's making the song better. And so this tune taught me a lot about that relentless punk rock beat with this finesse and also not to be afraid to come up with overdub ideas as a drummer because guitar players and vocalists and percussion, that's normal for overdubbing, but for putting two drum sets or maybe a, a drum set with some tom-toms, if you know how to do it, it doesn't get in the way. And Brian Eno is such a brilliant engineer and producer that he was able to mix this song with every instrument having its own spot. The hi-hat and the ride cymbal and the crash cymbal up here, kick drum lower, the overdubs right in the mid. And the beginning of it, this bass part, uh, Porn of Papyros, my band took that idea and kind of went with it for a song called Pets. And you also hear it in a Pink Floyd song. It's this great bass with echo that starts the song. So Floyd, Brian Eno, Porn of Papyros, we kind of use this idea to start a tune with. But once you hear these drums kick in, just like the other few tunes that we've been playing, the tuning of the snare drum and take a, a, a personal approach and not to have it sound like any other band. Uh, if you have time, listen to the whole record. Like I say, it's, a, it's an amazing experience. Each tune is different. There's no other tune on the record that sounds like this song, Third Uncle. But this has somewhat of what Elvis Costello was doing. Uh, this cool English punk rock in the face attitude. It's it's cold as steel, but still kind of warm and, and kind of gives you a good hug. And like those other tunes, that ends too quick. And the guitar playing is so frantic. 
Uh, I think Brian Eno's on guitar. It's just, you can really get a chance to know what his personality is. And if you look at this picture, you can see how David Bowie was influenced by him, in my opinion. And Bowie started using him as a producer. But it almost looks like David Bowie on that album cover, doesn't it? So let's check out Third Uncle. Listen to this bass line. Think about Pets by Porn for Pyros. Yeah. And here comes the snare riff. It's got a James Brown funkiness to it if James took a lot of speed. Everyone is changing and, and taking spots in the highlight. Everyone gets a spotlight. It takes a while for the vocals to come in. Just laying it down. You hear those overdubs? What a cool mix. You can hear everything. One verse and off to the races. It's a pretty simple drum beat, but it's not easy to play that steady and that aggressive straight ahead like that. Never faltering. And the guitar part's almost like a saxophone. Really melodic and abstract almost eastern european or maybe even north africa sounding that guitar riff almost hear a little bit of the hebrew melodies in there demented troubled psychotic right but it's danceable it's fun good tones so far we only had one verse <laughs> if you listen closely I think he's overdubbing on rototoms or he's naming all the things in life that are important but nothing as important as you. You can definitely hear what Adrian Ballou was turned on by, right? King Crimson. Fripp. I think they listen to Brian Eno. Psychotic, but pleasant somehow. Really can drive you crazy, <laughs> this song. My One of my favorite bands, Bauhaus, covered this. They did it with a little more muscle, a little slower. And Kevin Haskins, one of the great drummers of England, of the world, played it great. And Danny Ash on guitar did an amazing take on this. It's different, definitely. And Peter Murphy, the vocalist, has got this deep tone, so he does a, a cool version. But it doesn't, it doesn't change. 
it just kind of drives away. And I just love that because it's like I say, psychotic guitar playing, really tight drumming and overdub tom toms never a crash cymbal or a ride cymbal and it, it really gives me the idea when i go into the studio of like what what's possible for a drummer maybe if i can lay down something real simple and then overdub something over it i can have this ensemble with myself and you know brian eno i always thought i would love to be in a studio with him for a day or two or a month who knows and work with him and, and learn from him and sit next to him and watch him and just to see how this this crazy brain works you know what he did with with you two and and bowie was just incredible and uh, i think with the bowie records he used adrian blue on guitar so you definitely hear that coming out of that 1974 record and uh, third uncle to me is still one of the great tunes of all time even though it's so strange and there's not much to it and the lyrics are cool. Like I said, he's talking about all the things in life, movies, shoes, food, but nothing's like you. It's about love. It's about friendship. That's what I think. I don't know what the name means, third uncle. Who knows? Maybe it's an English joke. But um, so cool. That was Brian Eno. And like I say, get a chance, listen to any Eno record, but taking Tiger Mountain by strategy is that one. Uh, let's move on to the next track. And this is where it all changed for me, Gang of Four. Now, there's a certain sense of danger and, I guess, in a sense, uh, you know, uncertainty on, on what they're going to do. They're so unpredictable, this band. And every song has got this, this funk to it. But it's such a new funk, and I've never heard anything like it. Now, Hugo, the drummer, is, I got a cool story. I was at a Raiders game when Raiders were in Los Angeles, and I look next to me. There's Hugo. Hey, Hugo, I can't believe it. I get to meet you at a Raiders game. And about two weeks later, I went to a Who concert. Who's sitting next to me? Hugo. So we went to a couple of venues together. Well, we didn't go together, but we hung out together, and we got to talk. And uh, he is just an incredible drummer, underrated. No one talks about him, but he's so selective on what he does. And he's so original. And what he did with the guitar and the bass player was this great combination. Uh, it's like a puzzle. They always fit together. Uh, the guitar player ended up producing the Chili Peppers' first record. And you can hear a lot of the Chili Peppers uh, I guess the early Chili Peppers, you can hear a lot of that Gang of Four music that influenced them. And right before COVID, I played a party with the Chili Peppers. Chad was out of town, and we actually picked this song to play, Not Great Men. And it was Fushante's first show back with the band. And so it was, uh, I don't know, maybe a year ago. And so it was Jane's Addiction, Fishbone. Chili Peppers, Thelonious Monster, and Tommy Shaw of Styx. I played with four out of five bands that day. I played with the Chili Peppers, Fishbone, Jane's Addiction, and Tommy Shaw. Actually, I played with Thelonious Monster, too. I played with all the bands. So it was one of the great days of my life, really. It really was. Playing with uh, the boys that I grew up with. It felt like 1987 again. And... Uh, John Frusciante joined Jane's Addiction that day as well. But anyways, this song is called Not Great Men. And like any Gang of Four song, it's got this real unusual, simple, that's simple approach. And the, the simplicity is incredible, but it's so complicated to do it. And I play drums to it a lot. I go put my headphones on and I try to match what Hugo does. And it's just remarkable, his response. It's, it's African, it's Jamaican, and it's definitely fresh and original. And the way he tunes his drums, kind of like the other tracks we're listening to, is so important. And I always took that to the drum set when I get in my room, like Stuart Copeland or Neil Peart. They have a sound, Bonham, of course. And you think, 
it's not only the way they recorded the band, it's the way the drummer hits the drums, but it's also the way the drummer tunes the drums. Uh, like Budgie from Susie and the Banshees, one of my favorites as well. Such cool tuning. But uh, let's check out Hugo and, uh, well, they call him Hugh Burnham, but I call him Hugo. Gang of Four, not great men. Steady on the kick drum. Everyone gets a chance. Kick, kick, tom, snare. So tight. Accordion, maybe? I think you can hear the chili peppers in that, right? Check out this drum fill. Tom Tom. I just want a pogo stick on this one. Perfectly put together track. Drum fell. Tom Tom and Snare. Check out this guitar solo. It's not a guitar solo. <laughs> it's a drum solo. The bass player hung out with Porno Papyrus for a bit, too. So tight. So stabby. <laughs> cool production. Definitely Jamaican or, or ska feel. Drum fill. So unusual to play a song, play along to this. So against my own instincts. Yeah. Wow. I would love to show you and play the, the version I did with the Chili Peppers. It was uh, a little more hyper, a little more pumped up, but I really tried to match Hugo's part. But it's so cool how that kick drum is just so steady, using the snare and the tom-tom as a, as a musical experience, and, and then that big fat drum fill. And what a great drum sound, you know? It's dead, thuddy, but fat and thick. And he's so precise and he's so selective on the drum parts that he does. And he never kind of strays from that. And if you listen to the Gang of Four catalog, all the tunes have that great, I guess in a sense, they, they really focus, you know? It's punk rock, but it's disciplined and it's funky. And I, I really think that Hugo is one of the great underrated drummers and uh, hanging out with him at the ball game and at the who show was almost better than watching the band play just to sit next to him and talk music. And I love Hugo's drumming and the band itself is just so original and that's so hard to find, you know? So that's gang of four. And uh, let's see what's next. I think we got one more track. For our Tuesday morning. Okay, so missing persons. Now, Terry Bozio is one of the all-time greatest drummers ever on planet Earth. 
And when I was 12 years old, I got a chance to play with Dweezil Zappa. And we would hang out at Frank's house in Laurel Canyon. And we, I think the song Valley Girl was a hit at the time. So Frank was trying to put together a band for Moon, his daughter, and Dweezil, his son. And so I got to be on drums. And Scott Marshall was playing bass. Scott Marshall is Gary Marshall's son. Gary has passed away, but the great producer director from Happy Days and Mark and Mindy and Pretty Woman, etc. And actually put me in a movie called Exit to Eden. If you ever have a chance to see that, uh, Gary Marshall put me in there as a drummer. But so we spent time up at Frank's house. And Frank, I, I heard the name, but at 12 years old, I wasn't that aware of his music. I think Dweezil must have been 10 or 11 because I was only 12. But I think Bozio was not in the band anymore. It could have been Wackerman. But uh, I had all these cracked cymbals. And Frank's like, let me take you to Joe's Garage Warehouse in North Hollywood. And he grabbed a bunch of cymbals and Frank gave me a set of cymbals. I'm not sure if they were Bozio's or Vinnie's, or Wackerman's, or even Chester's, who knew? But uh, that was one of the coolest moments to hang out with Frank, me and him alone, walking through the warehouse looking for symbols, and he gifted them to me. But uh, that's another story. Let's get back to Bozio. Now, when you listen to Terry, there's just such, in a sense, like he's surfing. He's surfing the drum set, and he's so musical. And this is the song, Mental Hopscotch, that taught me how to use the tom-toms in a melodic way, not just for drum fills, but to be part of the song, to be part of the beat, and to be incorporated just as important as the hi-hat is the 10-inch tom, just as important as the kick drum is the 14-inch floor tom. And he used these drums to tell a story, and he used them to kind of explore the the space of the song but never stepping on anybody and finding the perfect places to put them in and you know he's such a fat sounding drum set but he's so quick and smooth that it never gets in the way of the mix and you know as the song gets more aggressive through he starts throwing in double bass parts now as a kid i never had two bass drums i didn't have a double pedal till i was 20 something 23 or 4 so I always try to figure out how to do it with one bass drum. I would use my left hand on the floor tom and the kick drum of with my right foot and imitate double bass. So this tune taught me a lot about tom-tom work, uh, coming up with new ways of imitating my favorite heroes, but not actually having the, the right equipment, and how to put the drum set kind of like what Gene Krupa did for me, put the drum set in front of the band even physically sometimes i did see missing persons the drum set was in front but also the mix and the expression and the storytelling of the drum set was right in the front and uh that's what bozio still does he's he's a magic man uh, he's a great visual artist he's cool to look at uh, I sat behind his, what I call the SS Bozio kit, because it's the biggest a ship. And I love the, the music that he makes by himself as a drummer. He's a musical expressionist. He's like an organ player on a drum set. But with Missing Persons, he really understood how to play danceable beats. And um, this is Mental Hopscotch. I would play to this song over and over and over after high school. There was a few records I'd put on. My parents let me play from like three to eight, five hours of drumming in the bedroom. I don't know how my brother and sister dealt with it, but uh, this song they probably heard at least 10 or 15 times a day. So let's check out Mr. Bozio. Steady as you can go. And the playfulness with the cymbals, the bells and the chinas. Yeah, 
he's furious, you know, but he's never angry sounding. He reminds me of a Salvador Dali or Picasso. Roto Toms. Quick. Gets out of the way, but always leaves his mark. And the choices are the sounding of the drums. It's like a machine gun. Always playful with a sense of humor, too. He always reacts after the part, too, which is mind-blowing for me. But this is the Tom part. Tom. I did that with my left hand. And you never can hesitate when you play the Bozio. Now here comes the part where he gets a little aggressive. Opening the hi-hat and using those crashes in China's. Opening the hi-hat a little bit. I think he actually had a black dot on the snare. No crack, just fat. Warren Cucuccilio. What a mix, too. I still use all those Tom ideas when I write beats now. How to use the Toms melodically. Working off the vocal part, experiencing the... Yeah. So, wow. You can, I love drumming so much. And what I love about it is it just makes me feel good inside. It, it connects with my heart. And I'm so lucky to get to meet Bozio. But before I got to, I thought I knew him through his drumming. And that's what great drummers do. You don't, you don't have to know them to know what they're about. You know that Stuart Copeland has got his attention span. has got to be everywhere because his drum parts are. Neil Peart is so disciplined and studied because his drum parts are. You know, Bonham is someone you can count on because his drum parts are. And, and Bozio is just so colorful and funny and responsive and in the moment because that's how his drum parts are. You know, and I'm talkative hyper, bubbly, happy person. That's what my drum parts are. So that's what I think drumming is. It's, it's a reflection of who we are in our heart. And if you can put that in the song and have people move their body to it, you know, that's, that's just a, a blessing to, to be able to do that for people. Um, I'm not sure if you've checked out the little slice of the new Beatles movie that's coming but they showed five minutes of it. it came out yesterday and to see Ringo's personality. And I've always loved Ringo. I've only shook his hand once and that was it, but he's got a sense of humor, but he's also a serious Englishman. And you can hear that in his drumming and, you know, such a great musician, but altogether, you know, funk drumming, which I think we kind of explored this morning is really uh, a way to make people move their bodies. And uh, I'm just so happy to be part of this. I guess, you know, the, the musicians, people sometimes say drummers are different than regular musicians. I agree. We are different. And we're a team. We're competitive. But we also know how to play together because there's drum circles. And we also know how to share our, 
ideas with each other and show each other how to do things. Because no matter what, we'll never play like the other guy. I could play levy breaks, and so could Gil Sharon, and so could Bozio. But it's all going to sound different, you know? And that's what's great about drumming. We can use the same ideas and the same drum parts, but it's our personality that comes out. And like a singer, you have to keep yourself in shape. Because a guitar player might be in a bad mood, but if he plugs into the Marshall and puts on the distortion pedal, it sounds the same if he's in a good mood. But a drummer really has to play what he feels. And if you're feeling not too good, you might not play too good. And so stay happy, stay healthy, practice your drums, love each other, and love the world because that's all we have is each other and Mother Nature. And uh, have a happy new year. Have a great Christmas. And I can't wait for 2021. And we'll put 2020 together. And the queen of DW. So have a great day. Happy Tuesday. And I'll see you next time.